Suppose you had been boarding with an old lady for forty years, and she never had a solitary thing on her table but hash. And one morning you said, uh, My soul abhorreth hash. What would you say if she let a basket full of rattlesnakes upon you? Now, is it possible for people to believe this? The Bible says their clothes did not wax old, they did not get shiny at the knees or elbows, and their shoes did not wear out. They grew right along with them. The little boy, starting out with his first pants, grew up, and his pants grew with him. Some commentators have insisted that angels attended to their wardrobes. I never could believe it. Just think of one angel hunting another and saying, there goes another button. I cannot believe it. There must be a mistake somewhere or somehow. Do you believe the real God, if there is one, ever killed a man for making hair oil? And yet you find in the Pentateuch that God gave Moses a recipe for making hair oil to grease Aaron's beard, and said if anybody made the same hair oil, he should be killed. And he gave him a formula for making ointment. And he said if anybody made ointment like that, he should be killed. I think that is carrying patent laws to excess. There must be some mistake about it. I cannot imagine the infinite creator of all the shining worlds giving a recipe for hair oil. Do you believe that the real God came down to Mount Sinai with a lot of patterns for making a tabernacle, patterns for tongs, for snuffers, and such thing? Do you believe that God came down on that mountain and told Moses how to cut a coat and how it should be trimmed? What would an infinite God care on which side he cut the breast, what color the fringe is, or how the buttons were placed? Do you believe God told Moses to make curtains of fine linen? Where did they get their flax in the desert? How did they weave it? Did he tell him to make things of gold, silver, and precious stones when they hadn't them? Is it possible that God told them not to eat any fruit until after the fourth year of planting the trees? You see, all these things were written hundreds of years afterwards, and the priests, in order to collect the tithes, dated the laws back. They did not say, this is our law, but thus said God to Moses in the wilderness. Now, can you believe that? Imagine a scene. The eternal God tells Moses, here is the way I want you to consecrate my priests. Catch a sheep and cut his throat. I never could understand why God wanted a sheep killed just because a man had done a mean trick. Perhaps it was because his priests were fond of mutton. He tells Moses further to take some of the blood and put it on his right thumb, a little on his right ear, and a little on his right big toe. Do you believe God ever gave such instructions for the consecration of his priests? If you should see the South Sea Islanders going through such a performance, you could not keep your face straight. And will you tell me that it had to be done in order to consecrate a man to the service of the infinite God? Supposing the blood got on the left toe, then we find in this book how God went to work to make the Egyptians let the Israelites go. Suppose we wish to make a treaty with the Mikado of Japan, and Mr. Hayes sent a commissioner there, and suppose he should employ Hermann, the wonderful German, to go along with him. And when they came in the presence of the Mikado, Hermann threw down an umbrella which changed into a turtle, and the commissioner said, This is my certificate. You would say the country is disgraced. You would say the president of a republic like this disgraces himself with jugglery. Yet we are told God sent Moses and Aaron before Pharaoh. And when they got there, Moses threw down a stick which turned into a snake. That God is a juggler. He is the infinite prestidigitator. Is that possible? Was that really a snake, or was it the appearance of a snake? If it was the appearance of a snake, it was a fraud. Then the necromancers of Egypt were sent for, and they threw down sticks which turned into snakes. 
but those were not so large as Moses's snakes which swallowed them. I maintain that it is just as hard to make small snakes as it is to make large ones. The only difference is that to make large snakes, either larger sticks or more practice is required. Do you believe that God rained hail on innocent cattle, killing them in the highways and in the field? Why should he inflict punishment on cattle for something their owners had done? I could never have any respect for a God that would so inflict pain upon a brute beast simply on account of the crime of its owner. Is it possible that God worked miracles to convince Pharaoh that slavery was wrong? Why did he not tell Pharaoh that any nation founded on slavery could not stand? Why did he not tell him, your government is founded on slavery, and it will go down, and the sands of the desert will hide from the view of man your temples, your altars, and your fanes? Why did he not speak about the infamy of slavery? Because he believed in the infamy of slavery himself. Can we believe that God will allow a man to give his wife the right of divorcement and make the mother of his children a wanderer and a vagrant? There is not one word about woman in the Old Testament except the word of shame and humiliation. The God of the Bible does not think woman is as good as man. She never was worth mentioning. It did not take the pains to recount the death of the mother of us all. I have no respect for any book that does not treat woman as the equal of man. And if there is any God in this universe who thinks more of me than he thinks of my wife, he is not well acquainted with both of us. And yet they say that that was done on account of the hardness of their hearts. And that was done in a community where the law was so fierce that it stoned a man to death for picking up sticks on Sunday. Would it not have been better to stone to death every man who abused his wife and allowed them to pick up sticks on account of the hardness of their hearts? If God wanted to take those Jews from Egypt, the land of Canaan, why didn't he do it instantly? If he was going to do a miracle, why didn't he do one worth talking about? After God had killed all the firstborn in Egypt, after he had killed all the cattle, Still, Egypt could raise an army that could put to flight 600,000 men. And because this god overwhelmed the Egyptian army, he bragged about it for a thousand years, repeatedly calling the attention of the Jews to the fact that he overthrew Pharaoh and his hosts. Did he help much with their 600,000 men? We find by the records of the day that the Egyptian standing army at the time was never more than 100,000 men. Must we believe all these stories in order to get to heaven when we die? Must we judge of a man's character by the number of stories he believes? Are we to get to heaven by creed or by deed? That is the question. Shall we reason or shall we simply believe? Ah, but they say the Bible is not inspired about those little things. The Bible says the rabbit and the hare chew the cud, but they do not. They have a tremulous motion of the lip, but that being that made them says they chew the cud. The Bible, therefore, is not inspired in natural history. Is it inspired in its astrology? No. Well, what is it inspired in? In its law? Thousands of people say that if it had not been for the Ten Commandments, we would not have known any better than to rob or steal. Suppose a man planted an acre of potatoes, hoed them all summer, and dug them in the fall. And suppose a man had sat upon the fence all the time and watched him. Do you believe it would be necessary for that man to read the Ten Commandments to find out who, in his judgment, had a right to take those potatoes? All laws against larceny had been made by industry to protect the fruits of its labor. Why is there a law against murder? Simply because a large majority of people object to being murdered. That is all. And all these laws were in force thousands of years before that time. 
one of the commandments said they should not make any graven images, and that was the death of art in Palestine. No sculptor has ever enriched stone with the divine forms of beauty in that country, and any commandment that is the death of art is not a good commandment. But they say the Bible is morally inspired, and they tell me there is no civilization without this Bible. Then God knows that just as well as you do. God always knew it. And if you can't civilize a nation without a Bible, why didn't God give every nation just one Bible to start with? Why did God allow hundreds of thousands and billions of billions to go down to hell just for the lack of a Bible? They say that it is morally inspired. Well, let us examine it. I want to be fair about this thing because I am willing to stake my salvation or damnation upon this question, whether the Bible is true or not. I say it is not. And upon that, I am willing to wager my soul. Is there a woman here who believes in the institution of polygamy? Is there a man here who believes in that infamy? You say, no, we do not. Then you are better than your God was 4,000 years ago. 4,000 years ago, he believed in it, taught it, and upheld it. I pronounce it and denounce it, the infamy of infamies. It robs our language of every sweet and tender word in it. It takes the fireside away forever. It takes the meaning out of the words father, mother, sister, brother, and turns the temple of love into a vile den where crawl the slimy snakes of lust and hatred. I was in Utah a little while ago and was on the mountain where God used to talk to Brigham Young. He never said anything to me. I said that it was just as reasonable that God in the 19th century should talk to a polygamist in Utah as it was that 4,000 years ago on Mount Sinai, he talked to Moses upon that hellish and damnable question. I have no love for any God who believes in polygamy. There is no heaven on this earth save where the one woman loves the one man and the one man loves the one woman. I guess it is not inspired on the polygamy question.